episode number two with professional adventurer Andrew Skirka. Welcome to The Art of Excellence, a show about people doing extraordinary things in their lives. I'm your host, Glenn Zweig. Thanks for joining me. My guest today is Andrew Skirka. Andrew is an accomplished adventure athlete, known in particular for his solo ultra-long distance backpacking trips, just to name a few of the more noteworthy ones. He has trekked a 7,775-mile, 11-month C2C route, a 6,800, 7-month Great Western Loop, and a 4,700-mile, 6-month Alaska Yukon Expedition. In total, he's traveled by foot, ski, and raft, and uh, some combination thereof, over 30,000 miles. He's been featured in a number of prominent media outlets, including New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and NPR, just to name a few of them. He's been named Adventure of the Year, both by Outside Magazine and National Geographic Adventure, and Person of the Year by Backpacker Magazine. It is my great pleasure to welcome Andrew to the show. Welcome. Thanks for having me, Glenn. This is uh, really exciting for me as a completely amateur uh, backpacker and adventure, which I shouldn't even use the word in your presence. You are essentially a professional adventurer. This is a big part of what you do for your livelihood. If you go back in time, think about growing up, think about going through school. Would you ever in your wildest dreams have imagined that here you are having had all these accomplishments around traveling the world? No. No. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, no. It's crazy, isn't it? No, no, no. I, no, um so I grew up I grew up in southeastern Massachusetts. My mother's a teacher, my father's a commercial loan officer for a bank, and they were um very conventional in what they expected of my sisters and me and um when I went off to Duke for undergrad, I thought for sure that I was going to come out of there sort of geared and prepped for Wall Street and do some consulting or investment banking and uh, or some, maybe some, you know, something in finance probably um, or maybe some public policy still related to the numbers side of things. So yeah, what I'm doing now is a complete departure. Let's talk about that pivotal moment. You go through school, obviously you must have done pretty well to get into a school like Duke and everything's going according to plan. And all of a sudden, I think, is it your third summer between junior and senior years where you decided, heck, I've got some time. Let me hike the Appalachian Trail. Well, there's actually some stuff preceding that. So I, the first, my first two summers in college, I went out to Western North Carolina and up in the Blue Ridge and worked for a summer camp. And every day I was rock climbing and mountain biking and caving and rafting and trail running before the kids got up. And there was that. And then I think the other sort of experience or factor there was that I was surrounded by people who were living uh, much more spontaneously, um, pursuing happiness over all else. Um, Like the financial part of life didn't matter to them. Um, They're living out of vans and uh, working seasonally, and then they would spend like three months climbing a Joshua tree. <laughs> and uh, so there, it was sort of this exposure to this alternative lifestyle that also was a big deal. So that was that was my first two, two summers in college. And I started, when I would go back to Duke each fall, I would kind of have to reconcile this experience that I just had with the culture at Duke, which is much, we're going to be the leaders of tomorrow <laughs> kind of thing. I at some point made the decision that I was going to make my own decisions. I was an adult and yes, I was having pressure from peers and parents and relatives to continue to pursue this very conventional path, but I was, I wanted to do something else. And I saw that I was at this unique stage in life where I could make decisions as an adult, but I didn't have any of the trappings of an adult, like a mortgage or a spouse or kids or a career, uh, or even if that matter, just overhead expenses that you seem to acquire as you get older. So I hiked the Appalachian Trail, and that was kind of the, once I did that, that was there was no coming back. I was like firmly on the dark side. You were hooked. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. And I thought maybe at the time that I would hike the Appalachian Trail and that would be the end of it, that I would like get it out of my system. But all that it really did was make me want to do more. And so when you said, okay, 
this is an experience unlike any other. I want to find a way to create a path toward doing these adventurous outdoor activities. Were you thinking, okay, I'll I'll do this for a diversion for a year or two, just like people go to the Peace Corps, and then I'll come back, get a quote-unquote normal traditional job or go to graduate school? Or did you somehow say, I'm going to figure out a way to turn this into a way to make a living for myself. I, I think that was kind of the thought at the time that, it, yeah, that it would be a diversion that I would come back and have to at some point face reality. But you know, over time, I started being presented with these opportunities to make a little bit of income from my hiking. So uh, like I remember the first time I was ever asked to, pre- to present somewhere, um, it, was a, it was a store in Minneapolis uh, called Midwestern Mountaineering, and they put on this big expo twice a year. And they offered to fly me in um, and pay me like $150 to speak at their expo. <laughs> and it's like, sweet, I'm there. <laughs> Uh, and you know, nowadays it would be a challenge to justify flying to Minneapolis for $150, but at the time it seemed awesome. And I just was sort of so thrilled with, uh, I was flattered with the opportunity that I just jumped on it. So, and, and put this in context too, I'm in my early twenties and I still have no expenses. I mean, I look, I'm sure you get one too, the statement from the social security administration every year where it states your income for each year. And I look back at those years of like 2000. Basically, after I graduated school, so 2003, 2004, 2005, 2006, all the way through 2010, and I am just like appalled at that I could survive on so little, and not only survive on so little, but I was still socking away 5,000 or 5,500 bucks a year in my Roth IRA. <laughs> it was like um, just a total dirtbag, just like living on nothing and making it work. And of course, the needs when you're young, single, very different. But aside from the financial risk of it all, going back to the fact that there's this pressure, you've got your friends at school getting big time jobs, going on to elite graduate schools in various fields. You've got your parents not sending you to Duke thinking you're going to become a backpacker afterwards. So I mean, talk about that pressure from family, from friends, from your just the whole context of of how you grew up and what was around you and and how you were able to somehow turn that off? Or or did you find that they were actually incredibly supportive and and there wasn't uh, the pressure? No, no, they weren't supportive at all. (laughs) They thought I was, you know, pissing away an opportunity to do something real with my life, um, that this was not, this was not part of the plan. Uh, And this was, you know, my parents, my classmates didn't really know what to make out of it. I'd always been a kind of a, an eccentric, unique kid in, in high school and college. So I don't think, I think that kind of fit the pattern. Parents, relatives, uh, mentors from high school, they just were like, you know, why? Why? You, you just, you're, you're at Duke, your parents are shelling out all sorts of money for you to be there. You've been sort of given this gift and you're just going to go be a dirtbag. Like, that's not. So yeah, it was an exorbitant amount of pressure. I remember some really tense family gatherings uh, when I was in college, where my mom was just super upset about what my plans were for my next trip. And it just it couldn't even be discussed is how intense it was. Um, and I, again, I just I, I made this decision at some point that um, this was my life and that I uh, if I was financially independent, I could make my own decisions. And in hindsight, I was right on. I, I didn't ever have a real job in my 20s. I don't think most people would still say what I do is a real job. And I don't feel like I was set back at all by the fact that I spent my 20s experiencing life. Because I know a lot of, like, I get contacted often by people who, it's something to the effect of, boy, I wish I had done what you did when I was young. And here they are, they're now 50, in their 50s, and they finally have, they, get, they, they kind of did the reverse of what I did. They started life early. So they got the, co- they got the job out of college. They had the kids, they got married, bought the household, the whole thing. And now they're in their 50s, early retirement, and now they're going to go hike the Pacific Crest Trail, which that's a fine way of doing it too, but that's a long wait. It's a long wait, and who knows what happens over that time. Now, you graduated to some degree in the wake of, of, of 9-11, so I, I don't know how robust the economy was. Oh, it wasn't, it wasn't good. That was definitely a driving factor in some of it, too, just that the, I, when, I, when I came into Duke, so this would have been 99, this was like peak.com, and 
um, the seniors that I knew, they would have like half a dozen job offers. And the juniors who were going to be seniors the next year. All of them had internships paying like $25 an hour. And then boom. <laughs> and there was nothing. I mean, like when we graduated, the scene was just totally different. It was very slim pickings. So that was definitely a driver too. It's like, well, like I could, you know, and this is not uncommon where kids or you know, younger people, um, you know, they look at when, when the economy goes down the tank, they look at those couple of years in the, when it's in the tank to go back to law school or to go get their MBA or um, to, yeah, to go, to go hike the Appalachian Trail. I mean, I, when I did the Appalachian Trail in 2002, Two, there were like distinct sort of demographics of people like everyone kind of not everyone but a lot of people fit into some kind of life story um, so there was the uh, there were the recent retirees and they, they were my favorite because they were the most committed to hiking the trail they were they'd been planning it for 30 years and they had like the best trail names like uh uh, now or never, 65 and alive, you know, just retired, you know, and and they were just, you know, they were very businesslike about the whole thing. But then there was um, another sect or another demographic where it was a bunch of laid off tech workers who had been working their tails off in the late, through the late 90s. They got let go from whatever they were working on in 2000, 2001. And they're like, okay, well, there is no, there are no jobs for me. I'm going to go hike the Appalachian Trail. I'm sure you've heard the story of the banker goes down to a small remote fishing village in Mexico for a vacation, befriends one of the local fishermen there and sees that the fisherman's pretty smart. Says, you know, you're, you're really smart. You could go to the States, go to Wall Street and, and become a banker. The fisherman says, well, why would I want to become a banker? He says, well, then you can make a lot of money. He says, well, what, what would I ever do with the money? Well, then you could save up enough that you can retire, move to a small remote fishing village in Mexico and fish. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You're the fisherman, and and no one gets it until they're ready to lead that life. I know it's hard to answer hindsight, you know, hypothetical questions, but let's just say that you know retrenchment in the job market hadn't happened. You're graduating into the late '90s in a very robust economy, tons of jobs, whether it's Wall Street jobs, consulting jobs, tech jobs. Do you think that you might have gone that path, and all of a sudden today you'd be some fat? wealthy investment banker <laughs> with uh, a bunch of money uh, but no time to spend it all no i probably just would have gotten laid off two years later uh yeah no if if the if the opportunities had been there probably yeah i could i could see decisions being different i saw one of your interviews you mentioned that you know going back to the appalachian trail you were having so much fun there you, you couldn't imagine doing anything else when when you use the word and i've heard you use the word fun or you're, you're really feeling alive out there. I mean, you're using the, the term fun in a very particular way, because clearly it's not fun like bowling fun. So, so what, do, what do you mean by that term? Because obviously it's something that affects you at a very visceral level. Yeah, so I think the best way to just um, talk about fun or sort of the experience that I seek out there. Um, so you can, there are like three different types of fun, right? So there's type one fun, which has, is bowling. It's fun to do and it's fun to talk about later. And then there's type two fun, which is not really that fun to do at the time, but more fun to talk about later. And then type three fun is not fun to do and not fun to talk about later. <laughs> and uh, the types of trips I like to do. And for that, man, not even just the types of trips. I mean, my, when I sort of plot out my activities, uh, I'm firmly in that type two fun camp. I like a little bit of pain and suffering and I enjoy the physical and uh, mental challenge of doing things. So I'm a, you know, I, I, the way I, the way I explain my backpacking trips to a lot of people is that it's a, uh, it's an, it's an endurance athlete's approach to backpacking. And they're like, oh, okay, got that. I mean, there's sort of that that desire for that pushing of limits, digging deep, you know, basically seeing what I'm seeing, what you're made of. Are you familiar with a term called flow? No. Flow is, it's essentially a word that's become synonymous with it in the zone. It's being so immersed in an activity that time stands still. You lose track of yourself. You lose track of everything else in the role because you're so uh, absorbed in the activity at hand. And it sounds like that's what your that state is what you're describing. Yeah, definitely in its ultimate form, that would be that would be it. Yeah, I think that's pretty difficult standard to hold for multiple months. <laughs> but yes, uh, when everything is sort of clicking really well, that's that's it. Gosh, there's been so many adventures and so many trips. 
But of all of these you've done, is there one that you say was the most demanding to get done? Yeah, in terms of difficulty, without a doubt, the most difficult trip I've done to date was the Alaska trip. So that was it was 4,700 miles, skied about, I'm trying to remember the exact ratios, basically ended up being like skiing about a quarter, hiking about half, and pack rafting about a quarter. Uh, so it took me six months. It was this big loop around Alaska and the Yukon. Unlike the other trips where there have been some infrastructure, like some trail infrastructure for me to follow, and probably to the existence of like guidebooks and topographic maps that I could just pull off the shelf and, and use. Whereas this trip, it was much more organic, where I was linking, linking together routes that other people had done. So like this a guy did. A guy went across the Alaska Range, and it took him two weeks. And here's the route that he used. And I would link that together with maybe something of my own to get me across the next the next mountain range. And then I would link you know, another trip that someone had done to get me a little further along. It was basically just this huge puzzle. And the entire time, what you're trying to do, or in planning the trip, was was trying to optimize the quality of travel, uh, following uh, basically uh, avoiding really thick bushwhacks. Um, trying to uh, utilize rivers that were moving in my desired direction of travel, following ridge lines where the walking would be really good. So trying to do that. And then obviously the logistics get really difficult too because Alaska is a pretty remote state. So the first the first quarter of that trip, I was able to resupply like about twice a week, which is really manageable. The middle or the next quarter or, or actually it was like a third, a third, a third. So like the first third, twice a week, middle third, about once a week, then the final third was like every other week, which amounts to a, a lot of weight in chocolate. I've always stayed on trails. I wouldn't even know where to begin. When you're doing a route like this, and as you said, even the longest ones you've done, thousands and, and, and uh, thousands of miles, were all various trails you know, linked together. And here you are for the first time going away from that, no trails, and trying to figure out how to traverse through mountain passes and, and rivers and what have you in, in a very, very harsh climate, uh, mind you. Where do you even start with something like that? In other words, like, do you find others that have done that to get advice? Do you just sort of figure it out one step at a time? I mean, where do you even start? Like with most things, you start small. So the summer before, I was up in Alaska for, I think, like six weeks. And I did a series of shorter trips that were, it ended up being one big trip, but it was, a, again, kind of linking together routes that other people had done. So I kind of, I took this, I took these itineraries that I knew would go and did them myself. I think when you're traveling off trail, what you're really doing is you're, it's basically this enormous pattern recognition problem. In this mind of yours, you have this database of observations about what you will likely encounter at a certain elevation, on a certain slope aspect, in a certain part of the state. So if I look at a map of Alaska, of a, and it's not just Alaska at this point, I, mean, I can look at a map of the High Sierra in California, the Wind River Range in Wyoming, anywhere in the Colorado Rockies, and I can just look at that topographic map, even if I've never been there, and I can pretty much tell you uh, what kind of trees you're going to encounter, whether it's going to be above tree line or below tree line, where there might be water, out in like Grand Staircase, Escalante, and Southern Utah, I can tell you if it's going to be really sandy or if the travel will be a little bit more compact. And that's just having been to similar areas before and being able to extrapolate. Was there any kind of fear going into this trip that you had to overcome, <laughs> whether it's the elements, getting an, an injury, encounters with bears, I don't know. Talk about some of the fears you might have had going into it and, and how, do you, how do you overcome that? Uh, so the Alaska trip was, um, I don't know if this is a sort of fair comparison because I don't want to belittle war, but um, I think that the stress wasn't that dissimilar to war. So where it's this dynamic environment and when I woke up in the morning, I, I had an idea about what I was going to do, but I knew that there were these dynamic factors that could throw that plan awry. So I could get hit with a really big storm. Uh, I could come face to face with a grizzly bear. Um, I could be pack rafting down the river and come around a corner and there's a, a big log jam and um, I might have to go for a swim or my pack raft might get jammed up on the logs. Um, I could be in the earlier on the trip with the skiing, like the snow conditions could be, you know, they would change from eight o'clock in the morning to two o'clock in the afternoon. And it would be different if I was at 2000 feet or 5,000 feet and different if I was in the trees or if I was up on a, up on an exposed ridgeline. So just sort of dealing with that level of uh, variability gets really stressful, really taxing. And I was solo and 
the difficulty of traveling solo and in situations like that is that you, there's no ability to download your emotions and look to someone else to kind of help you get a grip about yourself. So typically what would happen is I would put my game face on for however many days I needed to. I would get into the next town and then I would call my mother and like burst into tears, <laughs> finally letting some of these emotions come out because of how sort of stressful it had been for the last week or two. But there were some stretches where you weren't near people or civilization of any kind for days, if not weeks uh, on end. So was there a, a backup plan if you broke your leg, if you got attacked by a bear, if, if any, you got hypothermia, something happens? Was there a way for someone to find you or were you completely on your own? There's a limited safety net. So the longest on the Alaska trip, the longest I went, I went 24 days without seeing another person or crossing a road. And that was that was the longest stretch, but there were still plenty of other stretches that were, you know, where I would go like a week without crossing a road or seeing another human being. Uh, I basically never saw anyone in the backcountry, or the I guess wilderness is probably a better a better description there. You know, if something did go wrong, I, I had a satellite phone with me uh, um, where I could yeah put in an emergency call. But there there's a it's not a get out of jail free card. I mean, uh, there's no such thing as a fast search and rescue. And that's certainly the case in Alaska and even more so the case in the Yukon. I mean, the Yukon actually makes Alaska look civilized. Was there any point on that trip or, or any other where you felt that you may not survive it? Well, there were two maybe that come to mind. The best, the one that I get talk about more because it's funnier is uh, I had a very close encounter with a grizzly bear up in the Brooks Range in Alaska. And um, ended up kind of seeing it late. It was already charging me. Um, I s turned up square to it. I threw my trekking pole at it, yelled at it. And it was sort of so, uh, you know, it was sort of probably so dead set on me that when I started throwing stuff at it and yelling at it, it kind of had a freak out. And it turned 90 degrees, started running away. And as it ran away, it, uh, it crapped itself. And it left behind this like 30 foot long streak of berry crap on the gravel braids. And I've got this whole thing on video, not the not the bear charging at me, but sort of the aftermath. It's on YouTube if any of your listeners want to see it. And then, um, but probably like, so that was definitely, you know, a moment where it was very close. Um, the only situation that I felt like I put myself into unnecessarily was along the Lost Coast. This big storm rolled in, and I knew it was going to stick around for a couple of days, and I had to make a decision about whether I wanted to get across this bay, which was like a mile wide, or if I was going to have to like just hang out along the shoreline for two days until the storm kicked out. And I went for it, and uh, I'm not sure that was the smartest of things. When you're exposed like this and you've got the, the close encounter with the bear, you've got something physically you've, you've got to do, you've got the elements. I think you were in negative 30 degree temperatures, you know, in Alaska, which could kill you by itself. When those moments are happening where you feel that really heightened risk, do you say to yourself, think to yourself, well, it, if it ends this way, I couldn't imagine doing anything else and it would all have been worth it? Or do you say, what the heck am I doing out here? <laughs> Coming face to face with a grizzly bear. This is. I don't want to say I was okay with death, but um, I, I took those moments as a inherent risk of what I was doing and ultimately decided that that larger experience was worth it. Maybe the way to relate it is that every day, millions of people get in their car and drive to work or the grocery store or to the library. And when they get in their car, they're, they're accepting this inherent risk that something could go wrong, that they could get hit by someone, that a pedestrian could walk out in front of them when they're going 60 miles an hour and they're not able to stop in time. But there's this inherent risk that something could go wrong. And I similarly accepted that inherent risk of what I was doing. And if you're not okay with it, you go home. So part of what you talked about when you went from doing the Mark Trails to putting together this Alaskan expedition, as crazy as it sounds when you're trekking for thousands of miles on these trails, but you had sort of gotten comfortable and that you felt that you needed to get out of your comfort zone. Yeah. So is that sort of a theme of your life that whenever things get too, too comfortable, you feel like I need to up the game somehow and do something to push myself, push the boundaries, push myself. Talk about that. Yes. Um, so I get, I get bored with things that I've already done. What happened with the Mark trails? Like, so I, I did the Appalachian trail and that was really challenging up to that point. It'd been the hardest thing I'd ever done in my life. And then I went and did that C to C trip. So that was 
7,800 miles, so several times longer. I spent winter out in the trail. I snowshoed 1,400 miles. That was the hardest thing I'd ever done in my life. Then a year and a half after the finish of that, I did this big trip around the American West, and that was seven months, and I averaged 33 miles a day for 208 days. And that was the hardest thing I'd ever done in my life. But at no point, like after that Great Western Loop, did I ever go like, oh, I'm going to go back and hike the Appalachian Trail. <laughs> like that was just, there was never any thought to that. It was, it'd be like 12th graders saying like, oh yeah, I'm going to go back and just repeat eighth grade. And um, you know, nothing against the Appalachian Trail. It, it served a purpose at the time. It was a really valuable experience for me, but I'm not interested in that experience anymore. And, you know, nowadays it's, my life has changed since my last big that big trip in Alaska, um, but I have continued and sort of uh, you know, even since that Alaska trip, I've continued to push uh, the boundaries a little bit. So the the kind of my my current interests are doing, I guess like category you could describe the categories uh, backpacking high routes. They're largely off trail point to point trips that just encompass a single topographic feature. And the entire time from start to finish, it's just awesome. So there's no, like the problem with doing something like the Appalachian Trail or the Pacific Crest Trail is that you hike for a week um, through like okay terrain, and then you get to something really good and you're there for like a week and you hike through it. And then at the at the other end of that, that's something that's really good. You hit another stretch that's like, it's okay. And then finally you hit something really good again. If now when I look at that experience, so I'm, I'm married, I own a home, I'm a small business owner. I can't afford to spend you know three months out in the trail and maybe two thirds of that time I'm hiking through pretty marginal stuff. So with these high routes, the idea is that I've got a week, I drive up to Wyoming or I fly out to California or I, or I drive locally here in Colorado and I do this trip that follows say a mountain crest uh, or follows a watershed divide for the whole week and it's awesome the whole time and it's really physically challenging and it's, it's like as big a wilderness as we can find here in the lower 48 and then at the end of that week, I go home. Um, so that's kind of the my my interest now. And the other thing that I have going on is I've really gotten into ultra running. And so I'm running like 50 mile races, hundred mile races. And that again, is this opportunity to sort of push and explore. Whether it's these, these shorter or challenging routes you're talking about, or, or the, or the longer ones in, in past years, you know, we've sort of talked about all of the prep work and logistical pieces you have to sew together. I want to underscore the, the physicality of this. I know you sort of take it for granted because you're an ultra runner and, and you've been a runner for a long time. But when you're doing these treks, uh, you're covering 25, 30 miles a day and doing so with weight on your back and doing so off not nice, even soft terrain. So talk about the physical training. Yeah, that that part has always come pretty easy to me because I just I'm a, I've been running since I've been 14 years old and I. I'm not a great person if I don't run. <laughs> so I get, uh, you know, I just kind of need that daily dose. What's your daily dose? My daily dose is three miles. What's your daily dose when you're sort of in training mode? This week I'm running, I'll probably hit about uh, somewhere between 80 and 90 miles. Um, after we get off the phone here, I'm going to, I got a 15 mile workout. Yesterday I was out for 12. I ran uh, 18 miles on Saturday at 620 pace so um so yeah that's kind of where i'm at i run regularly uh, i run or every day pretty much and then it, it makes it pr- makes the adjustment to backpacking pretty easy andrew you're extremely goal-oriented clearly uh you would have never accomplished any of these things with without those lofty goals but at the same time i heard you say that it's not so much about the destination as it is the journey so talk about what you mean by that and how do you reconcile both the, the goals and the accomplishments you've had, but also the process, the journey being what means so much to you. Right. So, um, yeah, I, I firmly believe that it is about the experience in between the start and finish. Um, but I, I don't wander when I'm out there. I think when most people hear, well, it's not about the destination, it's about the journey. They think of like some, you know, pot smoking hippie, you know, <laughs> just and that's not me at all. And I don't wander. I find that when I set big goals for myself, that it sort of this motivating excuse for this the journey that ends up being so valuable at the end. 
But it's not that you'd be okay not reaching the destination. It's just that the experience of getting from point A to point B is as rewarding as it is from once you reach the mountaintop, so to speak. There have been plenty of trips where I have not achieved my objective and, it, and I don't let it go easily. So there definitely is, is value in that. When I think about those trips that I haven't finished, like that I've had to bail out on, I feel robbed of the experience that I didn't have. Especially if I felt like it was something, if the failure was something within, in my own control. Um, and so, for example, I'm thinking of this, a couple of trips, um, 2014, 2015, they were kind of in this high route style. And the guys that I went with, and we just didn't, we just didn't plan it all the way through. We didn't, we didn't give ourselves enough time. We let the pressures of like needing to get back to work, needing to get back to family, sort of, we try to impose our schedule on it. Instead of us just going out there and saying, you know, we're going to work with this thing and be flexible and give ourselves plenty of time so that way we can sort of finish up business. And as a result of you know, us not giving ourselves enough time on a couple of these different couple of these routes, you know, we, we would have to bail out like halfway through, two thirds of the way through. And the, it was clear that we were not going to finish. And if we continued on with our trip that we were going to be out of food, we were going to put ourselves at risk, we were going to miss our flights. I think when I look back at those experiences, I don't get frustrated at, well, I didn't make it to X point on the map. It's that I only get to experience two thirds of what I was trying to do. And the reason for my failure was my own fault, which doesn't, doesn't settle well. I'm sure you've heard the cliche we all have that follow your passions and, and the rest will follow. The money will come sure. later. I think for most people, when this, yeah, but my passion is, you know, fill in the blank, some sport or some leisure activity or what have you. And, and there's, there's no way to make money from that. That's, that's not a career. Somehow you're living proof that it can work. You found a way to turn this into a career, I assume. How did you do that? Yeah, it's evolved. Um, if you look at your passions and you're like, well, no one makes money off of that. You might not be looking hard enough because um, if you're resourceful and entrepreneurial, you know, usually if, if someone's passionate about something, like there must be a good or service that's, that someone is making to support that, right? You know, I was sort of presented over time with these opportunities to generate some income. And uh, in, actually, it was in 2006, I remember sitting down and plotting out like a business plan. If I want to make a go at doing this like as a legitimate occupation, what it would look like. I was spot on. So that was 11 years ago. And basically all of the opportunities for income that I identified back then, I have tried over time. Some have proven longer lasting than others. This isn't just like a sustainable lifestyle, which is what it was through my 20s. I mean, at this point, it's a legitimate occupation where I own a home and uh, my wife and I live reasonably comfortably. Um, I'm probably not making as much as I would if I had gotten that investment banking job right out of Duke. But uh, hey, I'm pretty happy. So that goes a long way. Open the curtain a little bit of your income. How much comes from sponsorships for speaking? I know you're also a guide. So uh, my the exact sources of my revenue or income change every year. Um, I get sort of some of these some of these kind of go in cycles. So for example, uh, this spring, I have the second edition of my book coming out. This book this book is basically like a it's a gear guide and basically instructs you how to pick the right equipment for your backpacking trip. And so that fr it first came out in 2011, 2012. So I had no income from it in 2011, even though I wrote it in 2011. 2012, I was on the road for two months giving slideshows and clinics. Uh, I gave like 47 events in 55 days. So I was generating income from all of those speaking events. I was generating income from selling the book and then... Uh, the book was selling pretty well in other places, so I was ge generating some royalties from that. But then, you know, after 2012, just sort of over time, it's it, it's been pretty steady, but it's come it hasn't grown since then. But now with the second edition, like the book will generate more income for me this year than it has in the past couple. So uh, that's a good example. And then um, I used to do a lot of public speaking. So I would go and like present for Boy Scouts or for an outdoor nonprofit like a trail association or for at an outdoor retail store. And you know, that was okay, but it involved a lot of travel. And um, I realized that there were I could make a similar amount of income without having to travel as much, which is makes life life at home a lot easier, and it's also a lot less stressful on me. Um, so I started investing more into online content. So if um, 
if you go to my website, you'll find a lot of instructive content on backpacking, like gear reviews and skill tutorials and trip reports and gear lists. Um, so there's a couple of different ways I have been able to monetize that online content. And then I, uh, I also started writing some guidebooks. So I, I sell those as digital downloads. Someone can go onto my store, and download download one of these guidebooks for like some of these high routes I was talking about earlier. Uh, and then I, uh, 2011, I started guiding trips on my own. And that was a huge part of my livelihood through like 2015. And it kind of became this monster where uh, I was, I ended up, I think I ended up being really good at guiding trips, but uh, I was guiding 70 or 80 days a year. I would offer, I, well, two years in a row, I offered 17 trips and had like 150 clients and every single trip was sold out. You, you were it, too good at uh, <laughs> Yeah, I was guiding. too good. So, you know, spending 80 days away guiding trips, um, making, making very good money, but 80 days away is a lot. Um, especially because like if I'm already away for 80 days, like how many more days can I be like, Hey honey, um, I would really like to go for a week long backpacking trip in Montana by myself. Like, can I, can I get another week? And that gets tough. I mean, I guess you could have said, well, let me build up that business to the point where I don't need to be personally the one guiding all of these. Then it takes time away from all these other. Uh... Yeah, I, I looked into that. And uh, at that point, you know, I'm outsourcing quality control. I'm I'm, high, I'm now I have employees, which makes the administrative stuff that that adds a, a load. And I would have to spend probably a year or two training people to put them in position that the organization would run by itself. And uh, when I looked at how I could spend that time, like if I, if I was going to commit to that, well, what else could I do with that time? And when I looked at that, there were other more promising opportunities. It sounds like you built a, a really successful business out of this. What I'm curious is when you think about all of the structure, the, the discipline, the goal setting, everything it, it took with the trips, the adventures, how has that permeated into these other areas of your life, into your business? All of those big trips that I did gave me this almost unrivaled body of experience and credibility. So I was able to sort of leverage that, if you will, into, say, guiding trips. So when, when someone would look at, say, two competing organizations, they'd be like, well, I could go out with Andrew Skirka, like the guy I read about in National Geographic magazine, or I could take a trip with this other organization that hires some college kids to guide their trips for the summer. At least I would think that'd be a pretty clear decision. That really helped. I think that the organizational part of my trips, like sort of, and that, um, that was always there. I look back at what I did in high school and like the way that I would structure my, my training and, uh, in college, like again, sort of this being pretty regimented kid, um, that was always there. So I don't feel like that was something like that I developed. Who would you say has been the greatest influence in your life? There are a number of people that have yeah, influenced me in one way or the other. Um, like my high school coach, obviously my parents. I've got a few mentors here in town, but I solicit of advice from a lot of people and then usually cherry pick what I like and, and go with that. Are there famous explorers that motivated you to, to, to push the envelope? There, there are a couple of people um, at points in my life that definitely inspired me to take it up a notch. So for example, uh, I remember when I was in college, I think I had done the Appalachian Trail already. And my sister mailed me an article about a guy that she read about in Sports Illustrated Outdoors magazine, which doesn't exist anymore. Um, and this guy was planning on doing all of the like big long distance trails in a singular, single calendar year. His name was Brian Robinson. And it was like, wow, I mean, this guy is planning on hiking something like 7,300 miles in 12 months. And uh, he's running around with this tiny little backpack. Like that style just really spoke to me at the time. And then there was like during, before my Alaska trip, um, there's another guy, his name is Roman Dial. He's based out of Anchorage. And Roman just is, he's been exploring the wilds of Alaska for decades now. Um, he, he's kind of legendary up in the state. And he was uh, hugely helpful with planning out that route and, you know, in a few different places helping me out along the way. So for people listening that are envious of your lifestyle, and I imagine there's going to be quite a few, and they say, man, I wish I could find a way to pursue a passion like that. I'm stuck in a dead-end job. I don't like. I've got the handcuffs on. 
I've got the mortgage and all the ins and outs of you know living life in the tried and true path. What do you say to them? Well, the grass is always greener on the other side. <laughs> so um, I agree that I've got it pretty good. I mean, I uh, my wife, she works at CU and she's got a pretty conventional Monday to Friday, you know, eight to five sort of thing. And it's a pretty big contrast of um, that we have. So I, I, I see it. Um, I, you know, I think anyone who, who looks at what they're doing and is just unhappy with it, then I think you, know, you commit to making a big move. I know lots of individual, not, I don't know about lots, definitely enough people to talk about for a while who were in that position and made this big life decision to just mix it up. And sometimes you know, some people have more flexibility than others. Like I got an email this morning from a, a guy who's on one of my trips and he told me uh, he just moved from Dallas to Montana, basically so he could fish and backpack more. And he's planning on hiking the Appla- the Pacific Crest Trail in April. And uh, he was fortunate that I don't I don't think he was married and had any kids, so his options were he you know he had more flexibility than than some others. If, if you have some of those other responsibilities, then I think you need to stick to them and see them through. But do what you can within the limitations you have. You can't half-ass it. You got to be kind of all in on it. It requires some pretty drastic decisions. No half-assing. I guess we'll. <laughs> and on that note, I mean, no, no truer words. I want to point out that you mentioned the book. I assume that's uh, the ultimate hiker's gear guide. Uh, someone could find that on Amazon, I would assume. Correct. Yeah, it's available on Amazon. It's probably there'll be, uh, unless it's, they've already been purchased, be a couple copies at REI at, or at your local REI. It should be in all of the stores and Barnes and Noble and that sort of thing. It's got pretty good distribution. And then andrewskirka.com, is that where they can find all this valuable content? That's where they can go. This has been a fascinating interview. Andrew, really appreciate your time. Thank you, Glenn. It's been uh, been good to chat. Okay. Good luck in the next journey, the next adventure. <laughs> Thank you. All, all right, right. Take care. Hey, thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. You can subscribe to the show at iTunes, Stitcher, and theartofexcellence.com. I've got one small favor to ask. If you like the show, please take a minute and leave us a review on iTunes. I would really appreciate that. I'll see you next time.